Almighty God and Father, we have not the words to express our gratitude to you for the sacrifice that you and your Son have made for us. That he left his heavenly abode, that he emptied himself, and he came down and walked on, on this earth as flesh, and became the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We thank you for that, Father, and we thank you for the memorial of his death, which we have assembled here together tonight to, to, to do, knowing that when we do this, we show forth his death until he comes. Bless this service tonight, Father. Bless our hearts as we examine ourselves and draw near to you and renew our covenant with your Son, Jesus Christ, and with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Around the world tonight, brethren on every continent, in every nation, I think by now nearly on the face of this earth, there may be a few little nooks and crannies, brethren of yours will be observing this service. In fact, the people in Australia are long since finished with it, as are the people in Fiji and uh, New Zealand and uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and the rest of the world going across the brethren in India as there are those there. I only realized recently that the Worldwide Church of God at one time had a festival site in India and that people actually transferred to India to go to the Feast of Tabernacles. And so I know tonight in India there will be people observing or already have observed this festival which we observe tonight. And our brethren in California will catch up with us in a couple of hours. They'll be the last ones, I guess. No, the Hawaiians will be the last ones to observe this festival that we tonight observe. It is a broad fellowship when you think about it, isn't it? It's hard for me to imagine, you get my mind around, the fact that the Pharisees, they, you know, not all Jews, but a very narrow uh, spectrum of the Jewish leadership, wanted Jesus dead. They actually conspired among themselves to kill this man. They did not want to kill him on the feast day, lest there be an uproar, so they had determined not to do that. They succeeded. They killed him the day before the feast day. But it's hard to imagine how a man who could heal a withered arm, who could heal a woman with an issue of blood for so many years, who could heal a man born blind, you know, who'd been another man who had been lame from birth, why in the world they would want to kill this man and take his life away from him is a little bit hard to, to understand. It's even, I think, more difficult, though, to understand Judas and how he was able to somehow work his mi mind around to betray not only his master, not only the Messiah, not only his Lord, but his friend. Because by this time, Jesus and, the 12, and, the, and all 12 of these men had become, I think, very good friends. Well, in Luke, the 22nd chapter, we're told that then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. Now, there are difficulties in all the gospel accounts and in trying to harmonize the gospel accounts of what actually happened in the sequence of events on this night and this, in the crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection. We have worked out, you know, as best we can. Scholars have done a pretty good job for us of getting us the necessary information. And we've worked out the basic structure of what took place on this night. In one way, the, the confusing little things, the things that don't quite add up from time to time, really are no giant problem at all for the, co the core of the Passover, the meaning of the Passover, what the Passover is to us, is clear, it's intact, it's understandable. Some of the difficulties could simply come out of first century usage of the language at the time. The fact that they were speaking originally in Aramaic, that the words were written down in Greek, a Greek that's 2,000 years old for us, and then had to be translated one more time into English for us to deal with it, we have idioms, we have expressions, we have customs of the time that are lost to us. For example, it should come immediately to mind that the Passover is not killed on the day of unleavened bread, it's killed on the day before the days of unleavened bread. But we come to understand that because the Jews had gotten leavening out through most of the day of the 14th, it was considered a day of unleavened bread, and therefore Josephus can speak of the, of the 14th of Nisan as the first day of unleavened bread in one of his books and speak of the 15th of Nisan as the first day of unleavened bread in another one of his books. It was just simply a way people talked about things. So the day had come when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John and said, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said, 
Well, where do you want us to prepare? He said, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there will a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him to the house where he enters in. And you shall say to the good man of the house, The master says to you, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. <coughs> what one begins to suspect is that there was in Jerusalem at that time, I'm sure, a quite large and flourishing uh, business for entrepreneurs in actually preparing for, laying out the circumstances, and actually almost catering Passovers for people who were coming to Jerusalem. If you think about it, you know that's going to happen because of all the late arrivals and people who have special needs, that people specialized in making ready and having a place and renting it out to people who came into Jerusalem to keep the festival. Well, they went and they found the man, as he had said, and there they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. We've come to see that this Passover was an exceptional Passover because the regular date, regular time of the Passover was 24 hours later. But in the structure of this little expression of Jesus, with desire I have desired, in Hebrew thought, in Hebrew modes of expression, this doubling up of the, of the words, with desire I have desired, is a way of expressing great desire. With great desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The very uh, expression, before I suffer, suggests the possibility that it might well have been an exceptional Passover. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus fully understood then that he would once again eat the Passover in the kingdom of God, that that would be when the Passover would ultimately be fulfilled. Now before they actually got involved in it, and we, we learned this by careful study of all the gospel accounts together, they did one other, he did one other interesting thing. Now before the feast of the Passover, John 13, when Jesus knew that he, his hour was come, that he should depart out of the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, I think the expression, the King James supper being ended is incorrect. During supper, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he was come from God and that he was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, and I'm sure the disciples were watching him every step as he went around. He got up, what is he doing? And he went and got a basin, and put a towel around himself after laying off his outer garment. And then he went around beginning to wash his disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. I think all of you know that it was customary in the ancient world, because they they walked in sandals over dirt roads, that when they got somewhere for the evening, for an evening meal or what have you, they'd come in the house, they'd take off their shoes, they would wash their feet. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And he didn't like the idea because the washing of the feet of a guest like this was the job of a servant, the lowliest of servants. And Jesus answered and said, What I do you are not going to understand now, but you shall know hereafter. Oh, well, Peter said, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Well, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. If you're not willing to submit to this and accept this. Simon Peter said, Well, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Jesus said, He that is washed need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all of you are clean. For he knew who was going to betray him, which is why he said what he said. So after he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and he had sat down again. He said, do you know what I've done to you? You call me master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, 
Happy are you if you do them. The words that Jesus gave in this situation are so explicit. And what I think is often not understood by those who would say, well, I think it's just symbolic. We don't actually have to wash one another's feet. We just we sort of wash one another's feet every day of our lives by the service that we give to one another. what this is all about. I think we overlook the fact that in, in actually doing what Jesus did, his act was unnecessary and was purely symbolic because they had all washed before they came to dinner. That's what he meant by the fact that he said, he that is washed is clean. But he washed their feet again and did so ceremonially and then told them, what I have done, I want you to do. And he also went on to say, happy are you if you, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. And so it's been a part of our church tradition and this is my 39th Passover. <coughs> I was remembering just this afternoon the name of the first man whose feet I ever washed. I've got to get on the internet and ask if anybody knows whatever happened to him because uh, I think that kind of thing when you know who that first person was, he's very special and I remember him, I remember where he was from, I just have no idea what has happened to him in the intervening years. We've come to that place in our service where we will separate for the washing of feet. And uh, I should have checked beforehand, which is the women are inside, men are in the room in there. Okay, and the men are over here around this area, these chairs here. So if you'd rise, the ladies could go into this room back here. And the gentleman uh, was directed, we'll go over to these. Back in Luke 22 again, and verse 17, continuing. And Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So first he has them divide the wine among themselves. Then he says, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So we understand the idea of the testament or covenant has its roots going so far back in history that, of course, it's almost lost to any knowledge of it in our society today, but it exists in Africa today. It existed in, I think, early in this century at least, among Indians in this country, of the blood covenant, the blood brotherhood. By whatever ceremony it might have been, originally uh, cutting and draining a little blood into a cup and drinking actual blood of another person to become a blood relation of that person to sharing of blood of an animal, to sharing the blood of a sharing a sacrificial meal, and all the way down to finally uh, the kind of sacrificial meals that God had under the Levitical priesthood, and the Passover, which is a sacrificial meal, <coughs> and this that we do tonight, the renewing of a blood covenant with Jesus Christ. He is our brother. We enter into, as it were, family. And with the partaking of these symbols every year, we renew that covenant with him. That's why he says this cup is the New Testament in my blood. But I always wondered when I read this in years gone by before I ever came into God's church, why the bread and why the body? I used to wonder a lot of things when I was young. I, I wondered why Jesus had to suffer. Why was it necessary that he, he go through this long night of agony and humiliation. Why was that necessary? Why was it necessary that he die the most excruciating death that man at that time had been able to devise, that of the impalement upon a stake? Wouldn't it have been enough to have just lopped off his head? Wouldn't it have been enough just to have jammed a sword into his side? Wouldn't it have been enough just to have stoned him to death? Why this particular method of dying? And it was a very long time before I really began to, to come to grips with this. And, you know, the Corinthian church caused a lot of headaches. And I think, though, when we get to the Sea of Glass and the Great White Throne, or whenever it is we see those people, and we, we, I think we really ought to throw a party for them, because if it hadn't have been for the Corinthians and some of the problems they caused, 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians would not have been written and they are an enormously rich source of information about the first century church and what they did. So I, I'm, you know, grateful to Corinthians. 
I'm singularly grateful to Paul because he took the time to write to the Corinthians about this. And it's in his discussion of this matter that the resolution of the question that I had carried for years finally came. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'll begin reading in verse 20. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. When you therefore come together into one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one takes before the other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Now, you should also know something about the Passover, uh, which I think has uh, not always been entirely clear. That in fact, it was the custom of the time in Jerusalem with the Jewish Passover that people would, generally speaking, eat at home before they came into the city to actually partake of the Passover. Because the Passover was, was a relatively small meal. The array rules, rules required them to actually partake of the Passover in the city of Jerusalem. Now, they nominally expanded the boundaries of Jerusalem to make that possible with all the pilgrims that had come down. But Jesus, for example, was, was not lodging in Jerusalem when he took the Passover here on this night. He had been lodging outside of the city. And hence, the, uh, we're, we're going to find Paul actually touching on that particular custom before he gets through this, that they would actually have a, a morsel only, a, the dipping of the sop, as it were. It was not truly a full meal that most Passovers were eaten at that time. Most of the meal was eaten, their, I mean, their main meal was eaten at home before they came in for that supper. Now, what he is saying here is that the Corinthian church, when they came together on this night to observe the Passover, Lord's Supper, call it whatever you want, I don't think it was ever Paul's intent at this point to give this festival a new name. Uh, I just think that what he is doing is drawing the contrast between your supper and the Lord's Supper. And so he said, when you come together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper, because in eating everyone takes before the other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another one is drunk. What? Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Then he says something really fascinating. For I have received of the Lord what I delivered to you, plainly the way in which this observance was to be carried out, Paul received from Christ and delivered to them. And here is what he received, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So he has the time of the service, which Christ gave to him, which he delivered to them, was the night in which Jesus was betrayed. When he had taken it, given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. You do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Notice, not blood, body and blood. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily, and that has to do, by the way, folks, not with your state of worthiness, but with the manner in which it is done. He says, you, they, you have come together in an unruly way, and you have partaken of it in an unworthy manner. He that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself. And this is what's fascinating, not discerning the Lord's body. And I can't imagine how many times in my life I had actually gone through some version of this service in another church, church in which I did not, flat did not discern the Lord's body and had not a clue as to what the Lord's body was about. And he said, because you haven't, there are many who are weak, weak and sickly among you, and some have died. He absolutely ties the discerning of the Lord's body and the judgment thereof to sickness and disease and death, which to me is a profound connection between the body of Jesus Christ and healing. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But 
when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And if anybody's hungry, let him eat at home, which matches the old custom of the Passover. If you're really hungry, eat your meal at home so that when you come for the Passover proper, the Seder as it were, that you don't come in there with this giant appetite that has to be fulfilled at that time. That you come not together unto condemnation. The rest will I set in order when I come. Well, there's a great deal to this and more than I would want to take the time to cover tonight. But I do want to go back, as my custom is, to Isaiah the 53rd chapter. A prophecy of the Messiah, and in fact one that now we know that some people who were of the Qumran community saw as a prophecy of the Messiah even before it began to be developed in the Christian community. Isaiah 53 is about the servant of God. Now throughout the Old Testament Israel is the servant of God. But in this other sense there is another who is God's servant and it's very clear as you read through the context of it that the one it's talking about is none other than Christ. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The Hebrew is a man of pain and acquainted with sickness. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. But surely he has borne our pain and carried our sorrow. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, not killed, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, we know, and I think it's been established well beyond any question, that you do not tie illness to specific sin. The disciples came to Jesus about the man who was born blind and said, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither. He's blind that the power of God might be revealed in him, and he healed him. At the same time, we do know that sickness and disease are in the world because of sin. That because man has turned his back on God's law, because man has gone his own way and neglected the, you know, the truth, well man's body starts falling apart on him. Man gets sick, and of course we do things in our environment that cause other people to get sick. That sickness and disease are in the world because of sin. And it was only really with the passage of time that I really began to realize that it was necessary for Jesus not only to die for our sakes, but to suffer for our sakes. This passage, as it goes on through, says that we all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off. He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. And what dawned on me was that of the things that Jesus had to go through that night and had to suffer, that these are the things that you and I also suffer in our life. He had to suffer a betrayal by one of his very closest friends, Judas. He had to suffer abandonment by all of the disciples who left him and fled and ran off into the darkness. He had to suffer humiliation through that night as he was spit on. And of course, he had to also suffer pain as he was buffeted and tormented. He had to suffer the crown of thorns. He had to suffer the whipping he took. The implication of all this is that we're the ones who should have experienced the betrayal. That we are the ones who should have been abandoned. That we are the ones who should have been humiliated and spit on and had the hair plucked off of our face and gone through the things that he went through. That he went through every one of those things which are 
the kind of things that you and I have to go through in our life from time to time. For all of us have at one time or another felt betrayed. All of us have at one time or another felt rejected. All of us have been humiliated. All of us have gone through those things. And he bore all those things in our place. Returning again to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That in the Lord Jesus, verse 23, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. They didn't break any of his bones, but they surely broke his body. And every bit of that was for you. If you'll bow your heads now, I'll pray and I'll ask God to bless this unleavened bread as a symbol of Christ's broken body. Our Father in heaven, we come to this place in our life knowing at least in some measure, all of us, what sickness means, understanding pain, and going beyond that to understanding betrayal, understanding humiliation, understanding the rejection of friends and loved ones, and we know that on that night, Jesus Christ suffered in his flesh, in his body, the same sort of things that all of us as human beings have to go through, and we all deserve it, and he did not. But he took upon himself our sicknesses, our pains, our diseases, and it is through his stripes that we, in your good time and in your good way, can be healed. That it's even by this that healing is even possible. Father, now I ask you to bless this bread before us here tonight as a symbol of the broken body of Jesus Christ for our sins. In his name I pray, amen. The gentleman come forward and break the bread.
What we do this evening is also a confession. It is a confession that we, we confess that this death was for us. The statement that he makes, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come, is personal. When you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you personally show forth the Lord's death until he come, and you also acknowledge that it was for you. In the same manner after he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Our Father in heaven, the sacrifice of your Son the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth. We know it was not easy for you because of the way in which you spelled it out or played it out in the life of Abraham that we might understand that it was a sacrifice for you to give your son to be treated in the way that he was, to be humiliated, to be crushed, to be broken, and then finally to have a spear jammed into his side to pour out his blood and to die. Really? completely and totally dead. That if you did not raise him from the dead, he would still be dead. And we know, Father, that it is in his blood, and in his shed blood, which was shed in our place, that we have remission of sins, and forgiveness before you, and that we can come to you and call you our Father. Bless this wine tonight, Father, as a symbol of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, as all of us confess our part in his sacrifice and our great and abiding need for him. In Jesus' name, amen.
After this had all taken place, after the supper, Jesus sat and talked with his disciples for quite a long time. We're really indebted to John because John is the one who has the complete, this complete story, the complete uh, dialogue that Jesus had on this night. And it's always been our custom to read, read excerpts from it at this point in the Passover service. It begins in John chapter 13. I'm sorry, John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas, sitting nearby, said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we possibly know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's an incredible statement when you think about it. It's an absolute. He said, as far as the way to God, the way to know God, the way to approach God, I am the way the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Later he says in verse 12, Verily I say unto you, He that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you shall ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And if you love me, you keep my commandments. Now this is a fascinating statement, and I think one that has sometimes not been well understood. You remember earlier I said that what you do when you partake of the wine in particular, but the bread and the wine, the service, this is a covenant. This is the actual renewing of your covenant with Jesus Christ. And a covenant defines more, much more than a contract. It defines a relationship. You now are family, and you take on all the obligations of family. And oftentimes, and this was very much the custom in the ancient world, I remember an old man named Barzillai who had been hospitable to David when David was, was uh, you know, staying with him when he was fleeing from his own son. And I remember distinctly one of the words that David said to Barzillai, which was the, the complete expression of friendship, whatever you ask of me, I will do it. There just aren't that many people that you know that well and trust that well and have that kind of confidence in that you will make that kind of statement. But that's the kind of thing that has to exist and should exist in family. Whatever you ask, I will do. But the problem with that is, it's a two-way street. That is, as Jesus said, whatever you ask me to do, I'll do it. But at the same time, you are supposed to say to Jesus Christ, whatever you ask of me, I will do it. The obligations and the burdens that places upon a person are enormous. When you realize that someone trusts you enough, has enough confidence in you to say, whatever you want, you just tell me what you want, that's what I will do. Later on in, uh, this, uh, in the 15th chapter, he says in verse 1, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And I think that's a sobering statement. He said, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. I am the vine, my father is the husbandman. Later he will say, I am the vine, you are the branches. Now here we are, uh, we're branches. And he says, if you don't bear fruit, he'll take you away. Well, what does that mean? Well, I don't know for sure about you, or you know, each, each one of us is in our own relationship with God. But it does seem that he has, or claims, a right to expect something from us, wouldn't you say? He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And if you don't bear fruit, you'll be taken away, because you're not, you're not a part of this covenant. You're not producing with the covenant. And, and so he expect, has a right to expect certain things from us. And if we do not produce those things that he expects from us, 
will be taken away. Every branch in me that does bear fruit, he purges it, prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So it really should come as no great surprise to you in your life that from time to time God cuts something away. It's a part of the process of making it grow and produce more fruit or more flowers or whatever it is that you're trying to grow. You have to cut it back. You can't just let it go branches all over the place. It'll spend all of its energy and show and leaves and branches and won't bear fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. So he is going to cut away from us things that we don't need. Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken it to you. You stay in me and I'll stay in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except you abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. There's just no way on your own that you're going to be able to do that. It has to be through a daily, constant contact with Jesus Christ. I, I am the vine, <clears throat> you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. There's that promise again, and I don't, I don't think he's making that lightly. I don't think that's just words. I think that you have a right to expect that, but you only can expect it if his words abide in you, and you abide in him, and you're fulfilling your side of the covenant agreement with God and being submissive to him. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So whatever your fruit is, it glorifies God for you to do it. So you shall be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so also have I loved you. I want you to continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, just like I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus laid upon his disciples that night, and upon you in your turn, a burden beyond belief. That you are expected to love the person next to you or behind you or across the aisle from you in this room. As Jesus has loved you. And I've told you before and I'll tell you again. Love is no mere feeling. Love is behavior. Love has to do with how we treat one another. Greater love has, has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. From now on, I'm not going to call you my servants because a servant doesn't know what his Lord does. I have called you my friend. And I have, well, everything I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. If you have, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and your fruit should remain that whatsoever you should ask of the Father in my name, whatever, he'll give it to you. These things I command you that you love one another. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Remember the word, verse 20, that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do to you for my name's sake, because they don't know him that sent me. He goes on in chapter 16 to say, verse 1, These things have I spoken to you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. The time will come that whoever kills you will think he does God a service. These things they will do to you, because they have not known the Father, and they haven't known me. He, he later on in this chapter, he will talk more about the, the, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom he will send. He also, in verse 23 says, In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily I say unto you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Up until this time you have asked nothing in my name. Now ask, you will receive. These things have I spoken to you in Proverbs, or parables. The time comes when I shall no more speak to you that way. But I will show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I don't say to you that I will pray the Father for you. 
For the Father himself loves you. Why? Because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Finally, in verse 32, he says, Behold, the hour comes, yea, now is come, that, he, that you shall be scattered every man to his own, and you shall leave me alone, and I am not alone, for because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. These words spoke Jesus, and then lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, which the glory that I, with the glory I had with you, before the world was. Verse 11. Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your own name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they were not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me to the world, even so I now send them to the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may be sanctified through the truth. And I'm not praying for these alone, but on them also which shall believe on me through their word. Jesus prayed on this night, not only for his disciples, his apostles, but for you who would believe on him because of their word, which indeed you have, that they all may be one as you father are in me and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 23, I in them and you in them, and, 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 I'm sorry, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them just like you have loved me. Father, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love for which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. His prayer was that that love that God had put in him, the love that was between them, would also be in us. That it would actually be reflected in the way we treat one another, the way we deal with one another, the way we relate to one another. And I can't help recalling, I, I passed over it in the reading tonight, but it's in this section where he said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And that love is not just the way we feel. It is the way we treat one another, take care of one another, look after one another, and care. Well, at the end of all this, we're told that they sang a hymn and went out. So I have a hymnal here. I don't know if uh, we have hymnals for everyone. Perhaps you can move around and share your book with others. I think what we'll do tonight is uh, we'll just sing a cappella and we'll sing a song that lends itself real well to a cappella. Number 106, Amazing Grace. Would you all stand? It's an old favorite been sung so many places in the woods and mountainsides and wherever else. Uh